All right. Good morning, everyone. Okay, that was uh, maybe like 5% of you, so we're going to try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, there's everyone. Good morning. Um, so uh, students, of course, hello, welcome. Instructors, counselors, welcome. Uh, parents, welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Rita Blake. I am the manager of education here at the California Nanosystems Institute at UCLA. Um, so welcome to the final presentations for the Applications of Nanoscience program for the summer of 2017. Um, I just, before the students started, I just wanted to give some introductory remarks just to let those of you who are visitors to our program uh, get to know us, get to know CNSI, and learn what your students have been up to for the last uh, two weeks and everything that's culminating up to these final presentations today. So, as I said, uh, welcome to the California Nanosystems Institute, or CNSI. Um, we are a very interesting uh, place here at UCLA because unlike the other groups or buildings or departments here, um, we are not a degree-granting department. We don't give degrees. There's no bachelors of science or PhD here in nanoscience. But what we are is um, an interdisciplinary research institute. So. Uh, back in the early to mid 2000s, uh, when we had a governor by the name of Gray Davis, who I'm sure most of you at least remember, um, and back when California had money, um, California, uh, he decided that he wanted to open up these uh, California Institutes for Science and Innovation all across the UC campuses that were dedicated to researching the next hottest, latest, and greatest thing. So one of those institutes is California Nanosystems Institute dedicated to looking at nanoscience and nanotechnology. So there's one here, there's one in Santa Barbara. We're kind of sister campuses. And we really focus on kind of four thrusts as an institute. So we look at fostering team science. So we have um, about 150 faculty at the UCLA campus from basically every building that surrounds us. We're in the center of the Court of Sciences and all of our faculty members that are affiliated with us are from all different areas. They're from life sciences, physical sciences, medicine, engineering, um, all coming together to look at questions that can be answered uh, using uh, using the ideas of nanoscience and nanotechnology. So we foster these transdisciplinary uh, group science projects. Um, we also have a big focus on education because we are part of the UC system. So we do a number of different outreach programs to uh, teachers, to high school students, to elementary teachers, elementary students, to the public. We run a number of different initiatives like teacher training programs, public outreach events, these summer programs. This is uh, being one of them. Uh, we have a technology platform where down in the basement where the students got to go, uh, they got to see some of the different core labs here at UCLA where we have a lot of world-class instrumentation that researchers uh, both in and out of UCLA actually can use to be able to uh, make and see things at the nanoscale and even at the atomic scale, so seeing the smallest things that we can work with. And we have an entrepreneurship platform as well. So we also have an incubator on the sixth floor that houses uh, technology startups from researchers who are often uh, uh, graduate students who come up with an idea, uh, work on it, find that it has some market and commercial potential, and then actually uh, work on starting companies. So there's a lot of really unique things that happen here, right? So we're a big uh, institute with a lot of people um, a lot of space, a lot of ideas, and a few success stories as well. So it's a really unique space, and uh, we wanted to, in the last two weeks, give all the students here just a little kind of taste of the kind of work that really happens here um, among the researchers. So there's a lot of people that have been working both uh, with students and behind the scenes to make everything that happened here a success. Um, first, there's a lot of uh, leadership associated with um, CNSI and education specifically. Uh, Dr. Sarah Tolbert, uh, who is the faculty director of the Nanoscience Outreach Program, uh, who's also a researcher in the chemistry department and here at CNSI. Um, she gave the students actually a guest lecture in the second week talking about uh, her research and her process as an interdisciplinary scientist. She'll probably be popping in at some point today and hopefully asking questions for some of our presenters. 
We also uh, need to thank our director of CNSI, uh, Dr. Jeff Miller, and our executive director, Sonia Luna, for all of their programmatic support uh, and infrastructure support in helping to make all of these classes happen. Uh, without their support, you know, simply wouldn't get done. Um, I personally have to give a big thank you to our program coordinator, uh, Dr. Elaine Morita, who helped keep, uh, I think, my brain and our instructors' brains all <laughs> coordinated. Um, and probably uh, you all, all received emails from her at some point just giving you guys um, the information that you needed to know. And she's absolutely instrumental in making all of the wheels turn. So big thank you to Elaine. And I mean, I, I think everyone deserves the biggest thanks, but truly I think <laughs> one of the biggest thanks has to go to all of our instructors who really worked so hard this year on bringing this curriculum to life. Um, this, uh, among all of our summer programs here at CNSI, this program in particular is probably the most dynamic. Um, the curriculum is never exactly the same every year and it's very adaptive based on the skills and the expertise that uh, our uh, graduate student researchers who serve as our instructors uh, bring to the table. So um, at least, um, 60% of the curriculum that happened this year and the workshops and the uh, experiments was all new content. And for them to be able to put all of this together and do their work as researchers um, is a heroic feat. Um, so I really need to thank all of them, uh, Grace, Ty, Dominic, Morgan, Vanessa, thank you guys so much for all of the work that you put into this especially in these last two weeks that was full time and full on with this program. Uh, we also had a few uh, guest uh, instructors and a special, a special guest uh, critique uh, individual come into our program. So uh, we had uh, Rob Jordan and Matt Fontana who were actually both instructors for the program last year and both came this year to lend some extra hands. Uh, they got to work with the students while they were working on their experiments and their presentations to give them more ideas, more feedback, more support. Um, we were also very lucky to have uh, Dr. John Ming Chen who is actually the previous education director for CNSI. Um, and the previous director of this program uh, come back this year also to uh, really give his insights and his feedback into all of the students' projects and their work. And his insight and his knowledge is also invaluable, so thank you. We also have the counselors to give a big thank you to, who were really the people that... I know, Andrew's picture is really great. <laughs> um, so... I really also need to thank these people for all of the work that they did every evening, uh, being with the students, finding fun things for them to do, developing activities for them, giving them feedback on their projects when they needed it. These, these people really also worked very, very hard and worked every night to help us uh, facilitate this program uh, really smoothly. So they also are all graduate student researchers here at UCLA and had a depth of knowledge that I hope all of these students utilized uh, in preparing their projects because they're all just incredibly talented people as well. So Stephanie, Jason, Andrew, Marcus, Chantal, thank you all very much. Um, there's also many behind the scenes people that I need to thank, but I will um, highlight these four people in particular for all of the support that they gave us um, in getting all of the behind the scenes infrastructure in place for us. Um, Lucas Lee, our AV and IT manager. Uh, Nikki Lin, our director of special projects who helped organize everything uh, scheduling wise and management wise. Uh, Kevin Quinones, who is our events manager who worked with us tirelessly to make sure transitions between locations and things were smooth. And Mark, who is actually in the back of the room that all of you guys probably saw at some point taking your photo and taking videos of all the cool stuff you were doing. Um, he's our digital media producer and he's also the person helping us out with the live stream today. So for all of you guys watching online, uh, you have Mark to thank for that. So um, thank you to Mark and to everyone here um, for all of their work in making this happen. And also, a thank you to all the parents and to all the students for being here. Um, obviously, this program wouldn't happen without students, so thank you guys all for 
choosing to be a part of this program and for the work that you guys have been putting into um, the projects that you've been doing. Um, we're all really excited to see your final products and see, see the culmination of all of your work over these past very fast moving two weeks. So parents, just to give you guys an idea of what your students have been doing, so it's a an attempt at an attempt. It actually is. Uh, it's truly a UC college course that is compressed in a very, very short span of time. Um, they get two units of college credit for this course, and that doesn't happen in two weeks very easily. So we had a very, very uh, packed structure. Uh, the first week was a lot of workshops in the mornings uh, dedicated to teaching students about the skills involved in being a scientist that they're not going to learn in a chemistry class or a physics class or a biology class. So it's learning about um, the skills involved in uh, presenting science, in talking about science, in um, visualizing science, in, in studying science in stuff other than a textbook and other than a lecture. So these were the kind of skills that they learned every morning. And then in the afternoons, we gave them every afternoon a very unique exper experiment that touched on a different, um, a different locus or a different foci in, uh, in nanoscience. And then in the second week, it was them taking everything that they learned in the first week and putting it together to figure out their own research question and their own project that they were interested in exploring. And they had basically about two, maybe two and a half days to be able to get uh, some initial I ideas and an initial experiments done, which is really not a whole lot of time. So they, they did a, a very good amount of work in a very short period of time. So, um, so you hopefully will all be very impressed at what they have been able to achieve in a very, very short, short, short span. So with all of that being said, um, I think we're ready to move on to presentations. So just to remind students and for all of our parents to know what's happening. So each group, we have 10 groups of five students each. Each group will have 10 minutes to present their project, and then we'll have uh, five minutes, roughly, uh, for Q&A. And anybody in the audience is free to ask questions. Parents, please ask questions. Students, please ask questions. Instructors, counselors, anybody uh, who would like to can uh, be involved in this Q&A. We want this to be a discussion with everyone involved. We'll have the first five groups present. We'll take a quick break. Uh, the last five groups will present, and then we'll have some time in the end to uh, enjoy each other's company for another hour or so and have a lovely reception and then say our goodbyes. So unless there's any questions from anyone, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. So uh, with that being said, uh, group one, if you are ready, then, uh... oh, group eight? Okay, then group eight. <laughs> So your speaker notes will be here, and your presentation is up there. All right. Whoa. And um, this is your clicker. <laughs> Got it? So forward, back, pointer. pointer. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi everybody, my name is Rishi. I'm Sanjeev. I'm John. I'm Shalise. I'm Claire. And for our project today, we were analyzing which functional group best attracts copper ions from a solution. So before we go on to what our exact experiment was, let's discuss some background information on how we actually came to do this experiment. So we're all very interested in Alzheimer's and we wanted to explore further possibilities and see what we could do to maybe help further that field and maybe help solve Alzheimer's, but not entirely. So what Alzheimer's specifically is, is that what happens is there are these, uh, there are these proteins called beta amyloid proteins that start to form inside of the neurosynapses in the brain. 
And these proteins start to aggregate around copper ion deposits. So what we wanted to do was use self-assembled monolayers in order to attract these copper ions to hopefully slow down the progression of Alzheimer's. But what are self-assembled monolayers? Well, self-assembled monolayers are basically a layer of molecules that host the functional groups. And these functional groups, we're going to be using two separate functional groups. And functional groups are binding agents that attract to copper in this specific context. So what we're doing is we're using the functional groups that are right here, and we're using two separate functional groups, and we're trying to see which one can best attract the most copper ions to hopefully slow down the progression of Alzheimer's. So going back to our initial question is, which functional groups out of 11 mercaptyl 1 undecanol and mercaptyl undecanol acid would be able to attract copper ions the best out of a solution? And so our research hypothesis is basically suggesting that mercapto undecanoic acid would do a better job of attracting copper ions because they harbor both an OH group, it's the uh, compound on the left, and a uh, O minus group. So this means they have both hydrogen bonding features and O minus charges. So that means they can attract copper be better. Whereas the 11 mercapto one undecanol only has a hydrogen bonding group. So it wouldn't be as attractive as the uh, molecule on the left would be. So the first step in our research methodology was to first set up a calibration curve. Essentially, every solution that we create has a certain absorbance, and we can find this absorbance using something called a UV spectrometer. And basically, if you know the absorbance, we can know the concentration using the ca calibration curve we created. So first, we take a solution of a known concentration, and then we put our self-assembly model layer in it. And then because the self-assembly model layer has a certain functional group attached to it, it's able to take certain amounts of copper ions out of the solution and onto this self-assembling monolayer. Then we take our self-assembling monolayer containing solution and take its, a sample of this and put it into a separate beaker. And then we can take this beaker and put it into the UV vis spectrometer and then find its absorbance. And like we said before, we can use the calibration curve to find its concentration. All right, so I know reading is hard, so that says trial one. Yeah, I got you guys. So this here is our calibration curve that we made. So as John mentioned in the previous slide, when we use our self assembled monolayers, put them in the solution, take them out to see if any copper has been removed, we will take that solution and compare it to this calibration curve to determine the final concentration of the solution and determine how many moles of copper were most likely removed from the solution using our self assembled monolayers. So we have values between 5 and 50 millimolars, and we have an R square of 99%, which basically suggests that our graph is very linear and that there's a strong correlation between absorbance and concentration. So we can use this graph for our experiments. All right. Feast your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. These are pictures taken by yours truly. So what these pictures, pictures basically illustrate are these self-assembled monolayers with their functional groups attached to them inside of the copper solutions. So after adding the different copper moving agents to our solution, we used the UV vis to measure the absorbance. And we were expecting for the solutions with the MA and the C11 OH to have their peak absorbance below the stock solution. But however, as you can see from our data, the peak absorption of the MA and C11 OH are above the stock solution. And this is just a closer look at their maximum absorbances. So we used the UV vis to correlate the absorbance with the concentration. And we found that the MA and C11OH had an increase in concentration. And ideally, they would have a concentration lower than 7 millimolars. So as you see from our first trial, there are several errors that need to uh, be amended. So in order to amend these errors, we decided to do a second trial. Okay, so in the second trial, the big change that we're doing is in, for our stock solution, instead of using the 7 millimolar stock solution, we're going to be using a 50 millimolar stock solution. And we're going to have more precise measurements in order to avoid the error that we had in trial one. Okay, similar to trial one, actually, trial two had the stock solution as a bottom curve, which is the yellow colored curve. Um, this means that experiment still contains an error probably caused when measuring the copper sulfate for the stock solutions. For, uh, for our second trial, as we said earlier, we decided to use a 50 millimolar solution to see if there would be a difference from trial one. Interestingly, our results for the second trial shows the exact same problem in trial one, which is the fact that the MA and the C11OH solutions were both higher than the stock solution. So 
in the future, if we were going to do this trial again, we'd use a much smaller concentration. Instead of using concentrations in the millimolar range, we'd use a concentration in like the nanomolar range. And we estimated that the surface area of the SAMs were about 0.001 meters squared. And if it was able to capture all the copper ions and cover its entire surface, then it would be able to hold 2 times 10 negative 8 moles. And even that, if it was able to capture all the copper ions, then the change in concentration would be too small to even detect. And so uh, what does this mean for our hypothesis? So basically, our hypothesis was not correct. Uh, initially, we mentioned that the uh, mercapto undecanoic acid would be able to absorb more copper ions. But as you saw from both of our trials, there were inconclusive results. So we cannot exactly say which functional group in this context would have been better at attracting copper. And as Shalise mentioned, the change, even if the, if the SAMs did attract copper, would be too small for us to um, to measure, and so we would have to work at the nanoscale level with solutions and such in order to test that, and probably do um, more use more precision when getting our data. Uh, for future research, we can test the solutions in nanomolars instead of millimolars. This would require precise measurements during the whole experiment procedure. Also, we can try to use uh, SAMs as and the functional groups as indicators instead of capturers to de detect copper deposits. Lastly, we can use nanoparticles instead of SAMs for more accurate results. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so um, the way we divided the work was, um, you know, the, there's like two parts. We have the experiment part of it and then more of the analysis part of it. So Rishi and uh, John, they were uh, in charge a lot with preparing our self-assembled monolayers and getting them ready to be placed into solutions. Um, and then we were, we, um, Claire, me, and Shalise were more responsible for the analysis part of it. So we took the concentrations that were, uh, that Rishi and John prepared for us and we ran them into the uh, UV visible spectrophotometer to gather results. So your goal, if I'm understanding correctly, is to remove copper from the solution, right? So do you know or can you predict any issues that might arise biologically from removing copper that might, for example, deactivate other proteins if you remove copper from one cell or other important cellular processes from the solution? Is that a consideration? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't looked uh, too deep into that. But, but we do know that actually there may be problems in doing this, partially in um, amyloid beta plaques um, do come in different parts of the body, not just in the brain. Um, also, they come in the eyes. And also, it's suggested that the protein, when you split up into the smaller parts, they can actually possibly be more dangerous, but future research still has yet to validate this. So it seems like one of the limitations is just that you can't pack enough functionality on your surface to really detect. So what are some ways that you might think about being able to increase the amount of functionality you could put on a surface? Um, well, one thing we would try to do is to um, first there's a, increase the surface area of our self-assembly modelers. That means we have more functional groups, and that means we can take more copper ions out of the solution. This was one of the first things we considered. suggested that you go towards the nanomolar um, in your next experiments. Uh, would you say that the UV vis be the appropriate um, spectrum to measure to detect in the nanomolar? If yes, if you say yes, say no. If no, uh, what other techniques would you suggest to be able to help kind of uh, look at that kind of like some uh, precise and good algorithm? Although I don't personally know like what we would do next, but I feel that actually that the we wouldn't use a UV vis spectrometer because of years while when you get to a small concentration, it starts to behave in a way that we can't really predict and get any data from. So we'd have to use a different um, uh, well instrument for it and possibly weighing the mass of the whole self-assembly modeler compared to the actual surface. Yeah, and to build off of what John said. Um, I remember that absorbances typically for a UV visible spectrophotometer have to be somewhere between 0.1 and 1. So if we, and 
going into the millimolar range already sort of crosses that minimal barrier. And so if we were to go into the more nanomolar range, then that, uh, that may, the absorbances may be below 0.1. And so we may not be able to get good results using our UV visible thing, uh, machine. <laughs> Spectacle so tongue. <laughs> Such a hard word. <laughs> and you got the molecule names right too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so I have to do this yeah, interview? Exactly. I'm going to use the arrow. Oh, which microphone should we take? Oh, we're going to stand here. Oh, you can't, like, take them. Oh, never mind. They're, like, wired. Yeah. Oh, go this way. Yeah. What? Oh, I guess these are. Yeah. Because I have the composing. All right, then. Take Start it. new. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and then you go to speaker notes. Oh, okay. Hi, so today we're doing solidifying ferrofluids in a new way to 3D print, and my name is Gaurav. Hi, Matthew. I'm Sean. I'm Ashinja. I'm Alex. Okay, so a basic definition of a ferrofluid is a fluid containing magnetic suspension that forms spikes when a magnet is placed below the solution. Um, ferrofluids can solidify and turn into a liquid again with water. Um, current studies that are being done regarding ferrofluid um, so there are current studies such as um, using magnetic ferrofluids for treating hyperthermia by using ferromagnetic particles suspended in solidified gel. All right, so now we'll discuss about how the 3D printers work. As we all know, 3D printing technology is a technology that creates a solid object um, by an addictive process. So as you can see on this image, during the addictive process, the printer laying down the successive layers from the bottom to its top, and then uh, between each layer, they, they add some powders, and they use lasers to hit the powder, which make it strong, uh, make strengthen its st strength, so thus it form a solid object. Okay, hey, so our, the applications of our experiment um, are to create a new material, uh, ferrofluids, um, as an alternative to 3D printing. Um, and there are two main reasons why ferrofluids would be a good alternative. First, 3D printing is limited by the width of the film and by its material, which is plastic, meaning that it can't create very intricate objects. However, since ferrofluids are liquid and they're magnetic, they can be molded into very intricate shapes and very easily. Uh, and second, 3D printing um, as Xing Jing just said, uh, 3D printing prints layer by layer, um, meaning that not only is it time consuming, but it's very expensive, uh, whereas fair fluids can be molded qu very quickly. And so our research question for our experiment was whether uh, the initial nanoparticle size um, of the ferrofluids uh, would affect the quality of the product after sintering, uh, which is essentially a process of solidification, which we're going to be talking about uh, later in the presentation. And so because quality is a subjective term, uh, we're defining it as uh, being three levels. Uh, the first being that the ferrofluid did not solidify and remains liquid. The second being that it does solidify, but it did not retain its shape. And the third being that it solidified and retained its shape. Um, and then if uh, the post-centered product um, turned out to be a level two or three, would, we would test the strength. And so our hypothesis 
uh, was that there would be an inverse relationship between particle size and structural integrity, because as particle size decreases, uh, the particles um, are more evenly distributed and the um, structure is denser. Okay, so how we decided to set up our experiment was that we knew that if we changed the concentration of the initial ingredients we would use to make the ferro fluid, which was iron chloride solution, we would get ferro fluids with different size nanoparticles. So as you can see, there's a photo right there. That's one of the photos from the scanning electron microscope. It, it's, a well it's a good representation of the size of our nanoparticles. So we came up with sizes that were around 5 to 10 nanometers, 12 to 15 nanometers, and 20 to 25 nanometers. After we came up with these three ferrofluid sizes, uh, we would place each one in a crucible, and we would put two magnets on the side of the crucible at opposite ends. Now, the magnetic field that goes from the north side to the south side across the crucible would basically attract the ferrofluid. The ferrofluid would follow that magnetic field and kind of create a bridge across the inside of the crucible, as you can see from our picture. After the bridge forms, we would basically wait for it to kind of harden a little bit, and then we would place it into a sintering oven, which we'll explain later, and hopefully the ferrofluid would harden into a bridge structure. So uh, a brief explanation of the sintering process. Um, it's basically when you apply heat and you fuse particles together, um, basically it increases the electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and decreases the surface area to volume ratio, which decreases energy velocity when an electrical current is applied. So here it comes to our experiment process. As you can see on the picture one and picture two is our process when making solutions and then drop an enemy hydroxide into the solution, thus form the ferrofluid in the MX3. And then we, we put three, uh, we, we put two magnetics on each side, then form the uh, magnetic, uh, then form the uh, ferrofluid bridge. Uh, as you can see, we mark it with the green line. Then we put it, in, we put it into the sintering oven and then we heat them. Afterward, we got then uh, little particles, solid particles, uh, as you can see on the MX7, and then we collected all the all the particles we got in three in three different uh, in three different vo volume of this um, particles. Uh, there is a little video shows the pr settling process between the between the image two and it image three that shows. Uh, All right. <laughs> uh, I can describe. Yeah. <laughs> I can describe. Uh, you know, there are some um, man ferrofluid particles in the solution. So if we put some magnetic down its speakers, so you can see the particles will f will turn it down by the lead of the magnetic magnetic field. All right. So in our entire process so far, we've been talking about how we're going to make a bridge out of ferrofluid. However, when we tried to do it, it actually broke and turned into the particles as you see in the middle picture. This was due to it going through the sintering process. So first of all, when we made the bridge, um, it, was it was able to form a bridge due to it not being in the sintering process. This was due to it still having water and using the magnets to create a bridge, and then we removed the magnets and it solidified, but still had water content in it, letting it maintain its shape. However, when you put it into the sintering process, which basically removed all the water, it caused cracks in the bridges and caused it to completely crumble and you know, cause those particles. And then we were able to test using different nano-sized particle sizes. We had half, a full size, and two times the size. And so as you can see, that the two times the size particles were bigger than the one, and the one were bigger than the half. So each initial particle size actually correlated to the final product size. Okay, so um, our conclusion was that our hypothesis was rejected. Um, our hypothesis was that there would be, um, that particle size and structural integrity would be inversely um, related, uh, but that didn't actually happen because all of the test samples uh, were at quality level two, which was essentially that they were solidified, but they didn't retain their shape, uh, meaning that nanoparticle size does not uh, um, have any effect on the sintered product quality. Okay, so unfortunately, even though our bridge came out in like pieces, uh, we still we still noticed a couple things. Um, 
first thing was that the uh, the size of the iron initial nanoparticles basically reflected the final size of the granule that came out of the sintering oven. And it was actually proportional because like, as you can see, uh, for a five to 10 nanometer nanoparticle, it came out with a final granule size of about one to two millimeters. And for a 20 to 25 nanometer nanoparticle, it came out with a uh, size granule of about five to six millimeters. And there's like a direct proportion to that. Like five nanometer particle, uh, one, nano, one millimeter granule, and 25 nanometer particle, five millimeter granule. And also uh, basically, a possible explanation for this is that if you take, like, if you just take larger building blocks and you build a structure, uh, and all three structures have the same number of building blocks, naturally the one with larger building blocks tends to come up with a larger final product, and the smaller building blocks have a <coughs> final product. All right, so we had some limitations and errors with our entire process. So when we're looking at the nanoparticles as a whole, we're only able to observe them from a bulk size. So basically, since it's a nanoparticle, we have to observe them on a nano size scale. However, we didn't have full access to that technology to see every single process that was happening. So we were limited to only seeing at a bulk scale and very little nanoscale. Um, additionally, with each different size of nanoparticles, different ferrofluid products appeared, um, different ferrofluid <coughs> properties appeared. Um, also, when we were creating our ferrofluids, we also didn't have enough materials to create um, a huge amount of fair fluid for us to create larger shapes. So that's why we have to stick to bridges. Um, places where this product, this experiment can improve on is us not letting, us not making fair fluids at different days and then using it all on the same day because it dried overnight, losing water, and then when we rehydrated, we actually lost a lot of the magnetic properties that created it into a fair fluid. Additionally, when we're making a bridge, we only use two magnets to form a bridge where we should actually use a mold. However, we didn't have any molds at that time, but using a mold, you can have create different sh shapes and different objects. Um, and so the pros of ferrofluids are they're cheap and they're easy to make if you have the right chemicals. So some further research that can be done regarding our test is seeing if different methods can be used other than sintering, such as using a gel medium ferrofluid. Also, different particle sizes that we didn't test may work for sintering. It was solid. Yeah. Well, it's, it's actually, it's more of like the um, outside, the outside particles are much more solid and the inside is more of a paste. I noticed that you said that all of your granules were different colors. Did you have a theory as to why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an explanation either, I'm yeah. curious. I, I don't think we did. Okay. to determine the size of the nanoparticles. Uh, why couldn't you have used like a light microscope? Um, not enough magnification. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after your experiment, we suggest two improvements um, to do a better, build a better structure on the bridges. Is the idea that once you use the increased uh, more magnetic uh, ferrofluids, more nanoparticles, into your solution, then you then you can put it back into the sintering and do the same process and it will hold? Uh, I don't really think so because the reason why it doesn't hold isn't really the number of the particles, it's more of the concentration of the particles. It's kind of like, even if you have a really concentrated mix of ferrofluid, it ends up being mostly a fluidic substance. So once it enters the sintering oven, it gets evaporated. So then what would you suggest as your improvement to, to achieve your goal next time? If it wasn't to just say get more access to more ferrofluids, so then that you can achieve your goal, what would be your suggestion for you to achieve it next time? Uh, you could try the opposite end of the spectrum. Instead of heating it and fusing it together, you 
can try freezing it because it is a liquid, so it'll harden that way as well. Is the only solvent that you use here the water, or can you use a different solvent? I, I think we expanded on that a little bit, but um, we were thinking about like uh, using gel medium or something, because that retains its shape very well, but yeah, we didn't have time to experiment with that. And is that, is that ever a test? Like, do you prefer using a solution or not? Yeah, definitely. So I saw that um, there's other types of magnetic liquids, like your ferrofluids, but then I've seen some with like cobalt and stuff like that. Do you think you would experiment with other types of metals besides like iron oxide to um, so for the sintering thing, would that be something you would consider, or would you just stick with the iron and the water? <coughs> uh, I think it might be the iron oxide, because you can see it from the color, it's more like the <coughs> Fe3O4 in color, because it turns color red. So I think uh, our sintering result might be <coughs> the iron oxide. So next next group is group two, right? It's it's all normal after the okay. Good morning, my name is Amelia. I'm Evelyn. I'm Akilesh. I'm Trent. And I'm Adam. And our project was called Deter Determining the Efficiency of Different Metals for Nanoscale Pattering Using Self-Assembled Monolayers. How do I? Okay. So our experiment worked with a process that created ver creates very small patterns on a metal substrate using self-assembled monolayers, or SAMs. So a brief introduction to how this works. You take a silicon wafer and put a very thin layer of gold or some other metal on top of it and place it in a solution overnight. Then when you take it out of the solution, a thin layer of molecules, one molecule tall, has formed on top of the solution. Next, you take a stamp and press the stamp, you press the stamp down on the sample. When you remove the stamp, certain molecules in specific areas get pulled away. Then you place the new sample with certain molecules pulled away in specific areas and place it in an etching solution. The etching solution can only etch away at the places where you pulled away molecules. The places where there's still molecules, it can't get to that spot. So then when you remove the sample from the etching solution, you have a specific sample etched in the areas that you wanted to based on where you stamped. So each of these molecules are made up of three parts, the head group, the alkane chain, and the end group. But what's most important to note about the molecules is the one we used had, a, had an alcohol for the end group, and the alcohol is hydrophilic, so it attracts water. That's very important for one of our later experiments. So some important factors in creating the most precise patterns possible when using this patterning process, you have to make sure you have a good liftoff efficiency. So sometimes when you stamp the sample and remove the stamp, it does not remove all the molecules that you wanted to. You can see the molecules in red. Those were intended to be removed, but instead they stayed attached to the gold substrate. If you don't have a good liftoff efficiency and aren't able to remove all the molecules that you want to, you won't get the pattern that you want and you will have certain places not etched that you want it to be etched. Another important factor is having a very dense monolayer with molecules extremely close to each other. The monolayer on the left, you can see, is the molecules are all close together and dense. So you can create a very clear image where you have very obvious patterns that are very clear and you don't have etched areas that you don't want to be etched. 
if you have a bad monolayer where the molecules are all scattered apart and there's space in between them, you're going to get etching in areas that you don't want, and you're not going to have a very clear and you're not going to have a very high resolution for your pattern. So through some research, we discovered gold is not the only substrate you can use for this patterning process. You can also use silver, platinum, palladium, copper, and mercury. Keeping this in mind, we came up with our research question, which is essentially which types of metal substrates will create the most effective self-centered model layers for patterning? So some applications of patterning using self-assembled model layers are to increase the density of circuit patterns on computer chips, and you can also use them to pattern microelectrodes and microcrystals. And our research question is important because it allows scientists to choose the best metal to create patterns that have higher resolution and designs that are more precise and reliable. Originally, our outcome of this experiment, we expected that gold would be the best substrate because gold had the stronger bond with sulfur and that with a stronger bond, it would create a much more dense and nicely kneaded monolayer, which would allow for more accurate patterning. So our experiment was like two phase, and each phase was meant to answer one of the, que one of the, que the problems stated previously. So the density of the monolayer and the liftoff efficiency. So uh, the first part was to test the liftoff efficiency of three different metals and to see which one had the greatest percentage because that would be the one that you would most likely want to use for etching. Our second experiment wanted to calculate the density of the monolayers on top of the metal substrates. And so we used the same three metals and we used a process called water contact angle to determine how hydrophilic or how much the surface liked water. And by this, we can tell how densely packed the molecules are. So for our first experiment, as I said, we wanted to calculate liftoff efficiency. And for this, we wanted to use a process called reductive desorption. And so this is an electric chemical process which we used on three of our different metals, so gold, silver, and platinum. And we had two samples of each, so a before stamping and after stamping sample. And from this, um, we can calculate the number of molecules removed from the process. So I mentioned reductive desorption. And this is an electrochemical process that basically removes the monolayers on the metal. And this works by applying a voltage to the monolayer and the metal. And the electrons have enough energy with this negative charge to break the bonds between the monolayer and the metal surface. And so the more electrons that you send, or the more voltage, the more monolayers will be desorbed or removed from the surface of the monolayer. And from this, we can sort of back calculate how, much, uh, how many monolayers were removed. And since we have a before and after sample, we can calculate a percentage of how much was removed and see which metal was the most efficient at it. So this is the setup that we used with the electrochemistry. And what you can see here is our cylinder. And in it, we have our sample of gold silver or platinum, and we have a, an electrode to detect the current and a wire of platinum to send the current. And what we did was we would send the current, and then the electrode would pick up our data and find the voltage where the most monolayers were removed. So before we get into our actual data, we wanted to show a sample graph of what our data should look like. And so as you can see in the very middle of the graph that's pointed out, there's a peak. And so what that peak means is that the voltage, there was enough voltage to remove the most amount of monolayers. So that would be the point at which the most amount of monolayers were removed, or almost all of them. And so that little peak, there are formulas in which you can use to calculate the number of uh, molecules removed from the surface. So this is what our graphs should look like in theory. Um, so due to some errors in our procedures, we were unable to get a data for our um, stamped gold sample, but we were, we were able to get data for our st uh, gold control sample. Um, so as you can see from our graph here, uh, the peak liftoff efficiency for this gold sample is at negative 1.145 volts. Um, although we don't have data for the stamped, uh, we do predict that it would be a similar peak as we have used gold before in our previous experiments and have produced very precise patterns with it. While this may look confusing, this is our results for silver. And what we should take away from this is that the peaks between the stamped silver and the control silver are far apart, meaning that the stamp pulled out a lot of liftoff. 
<clears throat> what it also shows is that because it's so um, like scattered, it's not very clear what the voltage or what what the voltage um, was that required was required to remove all the monolayers. Uh, like silver, this is our platinum results, and what we see here is that the peaks are very close together, meaning that platinum had a very poor liftoff efficiency. And because the peaks are so far to the right, it also shows that platinum had very weak bonds, creating a very weak monolayer with the SAMs. So some limitations we faced during experiment were mostly dealing with the gold sample. Um, so usually when you have a gold sample on a wafer, you put titanium underneath it so that it bonds better with uh, the, the wafer. However, with our samples, we did not have the titanium underneath. Um, so during our rinsing process for the samples, some of the gold layers started peeling off of the wafer. Um, so during our reductive absorption experiment, um, on our first trial, some of the gold peeled off of the wafer and we were unable to get accurate data. Um, during our second trial, the data that was, we got was very scattered and inaccurate, so we were unable to get uh, a proper peak um, and we were unable to actually uh, calculate the number of molecules that were absorbed. So for our second experiment, our purpose was to calculate the density of the monolayers. And you can see in the picture that a dense monolayer would create a pattern that has a higher resolution than a monolayer that is not as dense. And for this experiment, we used the same three metals, which are gold, silver, and platinum. And we measured the density by using the water contact angle. So water contact angle is the angle between the metal surface at the bottom and the tip of the water droplet. You can see angle theta is the water contact angle for that water droplet. And a more hydrophilic solution is going to attract more water. You can see in the top right over there, the water is closer down, more pressed down to the surface, causing it to have a lower water contact angle. A more hydrophobic sample is going to have a higher water contact angle as the water beads up and does not press down on, this, on the sample. For our monolayers, we used hydrophilic uh, molecules. So the more dense the monolayers were, the more hydrophilic molecules there were, the more pressed down the water droplet was going to be, and the lower the water angle would be. So the denser the monolayer, the lower the water angle. The less dense the monolayer, the higher the water angle. So in the three pictures, you can see the water droplets on the three different metal samples. And you can see that the water droplet on the gold is the flattest, and it is the roundest for platinum. And on the table on the bottom right, you can see that the water contact angle is the smallest for gold and the largest for platinum. Because the water contact angle for gold was the smallest, that meant the gold was the most hydrophilic and therefore had the densest, most tightly packed monolayer. Platinum, at the other end of the spectrum, had the highest water angle, was the least hydrophilic, and had a much less dense, much more scattered monolayer. So if we were given more time to do the experiment, we would also like to test copper, palladium, and mercury. And we would also like to figure out why some metals work better in patterning than the others and try to apply those properties to other metals so that we can increase their liftoff efficiency. And we also want to get more precise data so that we can actually calculate the approximate number of molecules on the samples. Yeah, so mercury is like a liquid at room temperature, so we would have to probably do it in a very controlled environment where it, like the temperature was really low, so we would have to freeze it and only then put it in the solution to create the monolayers. And so do everything in like a really cold room. I, I have a follow-up question to that. So then uh, what would the applications, uh, where, what applications would be appropriate then if you have to keep it then at that cold temperature for that monolayer to exist? Yep. 
the yeah. second one. We had, uh, yeah, we put monolayers on all of our, we had six samples total, put monolayers on all of them, and then one of each metal we actually stamped. So okay. we had one just plain monolayer and one stamped monolayer. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Zach. This is Jack, Lou, um, Edric, and Kevin. And today, we're going to be talking to you about detecting salinity levels in water with biosensors. There we go. OK, so first, I'd like to give you some background on the topic that um, I'd like to tell you about biosensors and how they're being used in the scientific field. So first, they have many uses. And some of them are in DNA testing, in agricultural use, and even um, glucose testing. So there are some clinical and non-clinical uses on this chart. You, so you can see there's many uses. OK, so from doing some research, we found out that bovine serum albumin, took me all night to say that, or BSA, precipitates when unfolding. We also found out that certain types of salt can cause the protein to denature which causes it to unfold. We wanted to know if BSA can be the next cheap alternative to detect salt concentrations in water. A new salt detector could be used on an industrial scale in desalinating water. This detector can improve the speed and efficiency of current future desalina desalination plants. These detectors could then potentially be used in areas where lack of clean water is very prevalent. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we can use these, if these work, if this experiments work, we can use these, uh, we can use it in, um, after water filtration has happened in de the desalination plants, we can check to make sure that the salin salinity levels are safe enough for people to drink. So for the hypothesis for our, our experiment, we basically said that if salts can denature proteins and BSA, bovine serum albumin, is a protein that would denature, when it denatures, it forms precipitate, we can, collect, we can find out how much precipitate is left in solution, and basically we'll, we will find that there's an inverse correlation between the higher concentration at the concentrations and the amount of absorbance that is uh, found. So before I get into the design and methodology of this lab, um, I'd like to say that uh, we're doing this, the point of this experiment is to check uh, if our if this if we can use bovine serum albumin as a, a biosensor in our uh, in our experiment, so basically we have we already know the concentration before we're gonna apply the we're gonna put in the bovine serum albumin in and then check if our experiment worked. So we start out with four different salts: NaCl sodium chloride, KCl potassium chloride, MgCl2 magnesium chloride, and CaCl2 calcium chloride, and we basically make a stock solution of the highest molarity then dilute it down to different uh, molarities. So uh, we had different t uh, trials, so we made it into different molarities. After that, we would add the BSA, the protein, and let it sit in the salt solution for it to denature. Uh, after that, we would place it in the centrifuge, which is basically a machine that would spin the tubes really, really fast to allow the heaviest particles, or the precipitate, to fall down to the bottom of the test tube. and leave the supernatant, which is the solution on top with the proteins that were not denatured, and we could collect that and place it into the UV spectrophotometer, which I can explain. So, uh, 
So imagine that there are proteins. So these, his, fists, his fists are the proteins. Okay, so the UV visible spectrum photometer shoots a beam of UV, UV light, and basically it hits uh, everything in the solution. But the, high, the more concentrated the proteins are, so the more fists there are here, the, <laughs> <laughs> the higher the, the absorbance is. Because uh, is, as Kevin will explain later, Beer, in Beer's law, the higher absorbance there is, the more con concentrated it is. So. <laughs> All right, so beer salt, this is kind of like the glue of the experiment. It's a way we can check our data and make sure that it matches up with our hypothesis. And basically, this is the formula right here. A equals epsilon times C times L. A is absorbance, which, uh, which Ed mentioned is the concentration of like solutes in a liquid. And epsilon is the excitation coefficient, which is basically the number of photons a substance can absorb at a certain concentration. And C is the unknown we're talking for, uh, concentration. If our results line up with our hypothesis, that means when we plug in everything into here, we should be able to get the molarities that we know exist for the solutions we've previously uh, created. And L is the path length, which in our case is one centimeter. And right here's kind of like a visual analogy of uh, how Beer's Law should work. When you increase the concentration, the UV vis should give you different results. And like you see it gets darker, and this means that the absorbance increases. So here you can see some photos of us um, actually doing our experiment. On the top left, you see Grace and Jason's lab, which they so kindly let us use to do many of our experiments. Um, on the bottom, you can see all our salts and our different salt solutions, which we would then, like Edric mentioned, place in the centrifuge on the top right, and then through the spectrophotometer um, image there. Okay, so for our first trial, we tested concentrations of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1.0. And we let the salt solution sit with the BSA for about 20 minutes. After that, we put it through the centrifuge and then the UV spec, and unfortunately, there was no inverse correlation. So we, we went back and we checked our data, and we found that most of our absorbance points was actually between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7. So that's pretty close. So we thought that maybe we would see a clear inverse relationship if we tested new concentrations with higher differences between them. So for trial two, we okay. So for trial two, we tested new concentrations, which was 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 3, and 4. And this time, we still let it sit for about 20 minutes. We put it through the centrifuge, the UV spec, and again, there was no inverse correlation. So for trial three, we thought that maybe we needed to have the BSA and the salt solution sit for a longer period of time. So this time, we let the solution sit overnight. And during this period, we also found out that well, not during this, but, um, so during this process between trial two and three, we found out that at higher concentrations of the salt solution, it actually messed with the accuracy readings of this UV spec. So for trial three, we lowered our concentrations to 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, and so on until 0 0.1. So after we left it overnight, we put it through the U centrifuge and the UV spec, and again, there was no inverse correlation. So for trial four, again, we wanted to test out the time as a variable, so we decided to let it sit for longer than 20 minutes, but less than overnight to hopefully get somewhere in the middle, so we left it for an hour, and then once again, we went through the whole process of the centrifuge, the UV spec, and once again, we were left with no inverse relationship. So the result in what this means, our data was, um, there was no correlation or trends from any of our data, so essentially, it didn't really support our hypothesis. Um, we believe this, may have been, as Luke quickly mentioned, um, the first two trials especially, we were using higher molarities, and in particular calcium chloride, when it is above 0.1 molis, um, molarity, it interferes with the UV spec, which could have affected our results. All right, so even though our graphs and our data showed that, that uh, we didn't have an inverse correlation, we wanted to double check to make sure that it was uh, inaccurate, or like not supporting our hypothesis. So we plugged into Beer's Law again, and it didn't match our original uh, molarities of the salt solution. So therefore, using Beer's law, we also found out that our data did not support our hypothesis. So basically what we can learn from this, uh, base, uh, so what we found out was that if we increase the, the concentrations of the salts too high, it would mess around with the results that we got from the UV vis. So, but the problem with that is that bovine serum albumin is really stable protein because it's found in cows. So basically, we, there's no way we could increase the concentration of the salts and denature the proteins without messing up with the results. So from our, also from our data, there was no actual visible differences between our monovalent and divalent salts, which were the different graphs that we saw. 
the blue and green and the yellow and orange. And this is supposed to be important because the divalent salts have two chloride ions in them, which is supposed to theoretically uh, de denature, sorry, the denature the proteins uh, more than the monovalent salts. So, yeah. All right, so future directions for our experiment. Uh, originally, we wanted to use this and apply it to seawater. And the ocean has different pH levels and temperature across its different locations. So another way we can also test this is by changing the pH levels of the uh, solutions. In addition, pH also affects protein de denaturation as long as with temperature and time. So these are the three main variables we'd like to test later in the future time, uh, if you had more time. In addition, we'd like to test more salts. Uh, we only tested the chloride salts, and we didn't get any chance to test the bromide salts. And in addition, uh, as Edric mentioned, BSA is very stable, so we would like to find proteins that are more unstable and allow us to get a better uh, variety of numbers that we could use for Beer's Law. And that's it. Thank you. So like a protein that denatures like with more changes in like uh, molarity than BSA. Okay, BSA requires like you need to up the molarity of the salt solution by a lot. So probably like something that can react to low slight changes in molarity over BSA. So would you want that protein to be really soluble in water or not very soluble in water? Probably really soluble in water, yeah. Because uh, in seawater, salts are kind of they, uh, they're in, this is, like, this is what I'm looking for. They're, 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 okay, they're blended in well with the water in the ocean. And since we like to apply this to uh, seawater filtration, then probably something that matches closely to seawater would be the best option. Uh, I have a question. So did you ever see any precipitate in any of your solutions? Uh, no, no visible precipitate. Means that we probably didn't allow the BSA to fully denature, so we didn't have enough. We didn't basically allow it to. We didn't give it enough time to denature and then collect the supernatant with the protein left. Yeah, from the start, we weren't expecting to see like a whole lot of precipitate, but we're expecting to at least see something like along the sides or the bottom at least. But we didn't see anything at all. I think it's something basic like maybe like add baking soda to the solution to make it more basic or like adding like citric acid to make it more slightly more acidic. Because like in ocean water, even though the pH is different, it's not that drastic. Or at least for like the water we're looking for to, to desalinate. So you would use it with the BSA. Or like the yeah, or the new protein that we would use to measure for the so need level. It's not very much at all, really. It's kind of just kind of like around seven, but it's just we think that even maybe the slightest of differences could affect our results, so we aren't really sure of that, so that's why we'd want to run those tests. Don't dump waste in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we basically, oh, sorry. We basically covered most of the, uh, pop the most concentrated ones, so NACL, table salt. Uh, KCL was also one of the biggest ones over there. Uh, basically, uh, there's a couple, they separate into ions that are uh, more concentrated. So sodium is very concentrated and chloride. So we just basically tried uh, all, those, all of those combinations. Uh, another process we were thinking of is if we had a more soluble protein or a protein that would denature faster, uh, we could have collected the precipitate and weighed that in and checked that in with uh, different methods. Also, we were originally thinking of using uh, GFP or like bleeding fluorescent bacteria. Basically, it glows when it's not denatured. 
And so uh, when it denatures, it loses its glow. So you can visibly see there's a change in it. So something like that, where the vis vis visual indicator of denaturing would probably be another alternative. Basically because there's more ions there to dissolve the protein because there's more of a, it's more concentrated salt than it is for a monovalent salt. and then break after this one, yeah. So, hi, I'm Porvi. I'm Lindsay. I'm Jay Blum. I'm Damon. Uh, I'm Zeglin. And we did our experiment on a possible replacement to the current pacemaker battery using biosensors. So, a pacemaker is a device that's used to regulate heartbeat. And what it does is it uses electrodes in order to detect the electrical activity within the heart. And then it uses this information to send data to the generator within the pacemaker. And although this is usually successful for most patients, which are usually elderly, it does have limitations within younger individuals. And this is because younger individuals tend to do more physical activity than the elderly. So what, we, so what we want to do is counter in oxygen as a variable, and then do this in order to make sure that pacemakers don't malfunction while they're being in use for younger individuals. And this would be a replacement for the current battery, an oxygen sensor, and then if successful, we can use it for further advancements. So then this diagram is the current pacemaker now, and you can see that the main variable is electrodes, but we want to counter in oxygen as well. Um, just something add on to the background about how did we find, how did we come up with the idea about the alternative a battery? So we are willing to create a battery that can generate different current according to different conditions, um, or in this case, an individual's different activeness. We need to find one variable that changes or um, actually increases when people get more active. And also this specific variable also need to um, get involved into the creation of our current. Um, So we did some literature research, and then we find that, as you can see on the graph on the right, as the exercise measured in watts, which is basically the intensity of exercise increases, the blood concentration in artery also increases, which then leads us to our question and hypothesis. Um, before we actually go into the hypothesis, um, it is also important to notice that um, unlike normal pacemakers that are found in like places around our human chest. Um, our alternative battery uh, should be placed inside some um, in where it can contact with fresh oxygenated blood um, because as I talked about in the previous slide, we are using the oxygen to generate the current. So we hypothesis that some possible Places that we can that we can put our battery is, as you can see on the diagram of human heart, which is left atrium, right here, 
left ventricle, aorta, or pulmonary vein? Okay. Uh, our, our main question for this experiment is whether or not we can use glucose oxidase and bilirubin oxidase to use as a biofuel cell to power the pacemaker inside the person. Our hypothesis is just this graph. As we insert the oxygen, as the time passes, as when there's more time, the voltage it can provide will be higher, which means as the oxygen concentration increases, the voltage it can produce will also increase. The benefit of this biofuel cell is it can replace a pacemaker battery, and it can be more suitable for younger and more active individuals. Okay, so just so you guys have a little bit of background on what a biofuel cell is, this is actually a basic diagram of the biofuel cell. And as you can see, the GOX and the BOD are the two enzymes we're using, and those will both be placed into their individual gels, which will be connected to the anode and the cathode. And all of this will be placed in our solution. So as you can see from the diagram, you can see the path of the, that the electron's taking. It'll go from our solution into the gels, which contain the enzyme, into the anode, and through to the cathode. And up where the R is is where we'll connect our ammeter to read the current. So just a little bit of background. You hear me say free electron. And so this is actually the most basic glucose oxidase um, reaction that's going on. It is a redox reaction. And the glucose is reacting with the water to form gluconic acid. And it's leaving a free hydrogen ion as well as electrons. So that hydrogen ion goes on to react with oxygen and form water, while the electron is what's flowing around our system and what we're reading. So basically for our experiment, we wanted to create a biofuel cell that could somehow measure an electrical current when we bubble in oxygen into our solution. And when I say solution, I mean a mock blood solution that we created because we don't have access to actual human blood to test our biofuel in. So we created a solution out of sucrose and a buffer solution to put our bio cell, biofuel cell in. So to create our biofuel cell, we used two gels made out of calcium chloride and iota carrageenan, which is a substance that solidifies liquid into gel. And in both of these gels, we put carbon nanotubes in to make them conductive for the reaction to take place. In one of our gels, we used glucose oxidase enzyme, and in the other, we used the bilirubin oxidase enzyme. And with both of the gels, we connected them to a metal wire, which was then connected to an ammeter, which would then measure the electrical current that was produced during the chemical reaction. And to produce the current, we did pump in the oxygen from an oxygen tank into the solution. So in our initial experiment, we used 0.5% gel concentration for our gels. And actually, when we put them into our solution, they broke apart. And we, we then hypothesized that we needed a increased concentration in our gels for them to stick better together in the solution so that we could measure a current properly. So as you can see in our experiment, these are this is the ammeter, and trials one and two, we both tested the 0.5% gel. And in our first trial, we got 0.16 amps, and in the second one, we got 0.03 amps. And from the pictures, you can kind of see that there's a difference in both of our results. However, we realized that the difference is only caused by random electrical noises that was picked up from the ammeter. It wasn't, actual, it wasn't an actual current that was produced. So we had to redo our experiment a second time. So this time, we decided to test stronger gel concentrations to see if they would produce better results. So this time, we used 1.5%, 3%, and 5% of the calcium chloride in our gels. So while the 1.5% and the 3.5% um, held together much more firmly and were much more stronger than our initial 0.5%, the 5% solution actually never solidified and was only remained liquid. And we hypothesized this, that this happened because the calcium chloride concentration was too much for the iota carrageenan, and the iota carrageenan was prevented from actually doing its job of solidifying the gel. So as you can see in, this, in the second round of our experiment, um, our first trial was the 1.5% gel, and the second trial was 3% gel. And you can see that the amount of amps that were produced by the electrical current are much more in this round than the previous round. So the stronger concentration of gels did work better in producing an electrical current with the oxygen levels used. And we concluded that uh, our biofuel cell could potentially be used to um, function as a battery in the future because it did have a positive um, 
result in producing an electrical current. So this graph shows the, the effectiveness of the um, calcium chloride percentages as they increase. And as you can see, the 3% calcium chloride had the highest peak before any of the other ones, as the 1.5 did peak as well, but it had much lower and came after. And the 0.5% calcium chloride stayed relatively low most of the time, showing that it wasn't effective in measuring current at all. OK. Uh, from our experiments, the only variable we have is uh, oxygen amount, which is uh, oxygen concentration. We don't have enough time to do other things. So in the future, what we can do is we can use a better improved gels that can be more stable and better used for the experiments. And we can also use a more accurate physiology conditions, like more accurate pH level or a temperature that's more closer to the human body. Or we can even use the real animal blood to test our experiments inside. OK, uh, in conclusion, our experiment has achieved our original hypothesis of when increase the uh, oxygen concentration, we increase the voltage amount. Even uh, in our experiments, the solution includes sugar, oxygen, two, two enzymes, and uh, carbon nanotube. From this solution, we are able to form a gel solution that can conduct electricity. Even though there are some limitations in our experiments, but we can still prove, uh, it is also a proof of concept because of our product of our electron current. It can be future used for the batteries of the pacemaker. And adding on to that, um, while our pacemaker battery has many limitations, our experiment was solely to test the oxygen variable so our experiment was proven true because our pacemaker battery, which was the biofuel cell, did produce an, ox um, an electrical current in response to different oxygen levels. So in that way, um, even though we didn't test future limitations because we didn't have enough time, our hypothesis was proven correct. Thank you. So we didn't really specifically look into that. Our biggest concern, I guess you could say with this, was just even creating the current to see if this would even be possible. So I guess you could consider that our next step was to see how exactly and how well we could extract the oxygen. Um, really our main concern was getting the current to see if we could even start with that. And our main concern also, like for getting the current, centered around the chemical reaction that took place in the biofuel cell in the solution. So using that reaction, that's how we determined how the oxygen would enter and how the electrical current would be produced. So we didn't have like access to real human blood, so we can do all the limitations. But Yeah, so we started the timer and we stopped it and we measured the current over time and the current was always increasing and decreasing, but we don't exactly know why it peaked at that certain time. Um, but I guess what we can tell is there's different varying levels of oxygen, so we don't know if the oxygen, there was more oxygen at that point or if, because we were bubbling it, we were constantly bubbling the oxygen in. So we don't know if more oxygen was available at that time and that might have increased the amount of electrical current, but we're not sure about that. Yeah, that's something that we did um, um, discover along the way that we would have to be 
taking oxygen from the body and that might be harmful to the body, but we didn't look into that yet because we were just focusing on producing a current. But yeah, in the future, we might have to look into that to see how we could fix that and not really harm the body in taking that much oxygen from the blood. Yeah, so um, we actually, are, I have a cardiologist that I know, and I contacted him, and he said that um, really depending on the pacemaker, it, um, it was, I think, 0.3 to 4, 0.3 to 4.0 uh, milliamps, so we're sort of in the range, but then again, it's really hard to tell because we don't really know how the oxygen ratio is compared to the one that we pumped in um, to the body, but yeah. <laughs> Just something to add on to that. Um, so the current we generated is about 0.1 um, milliampere, and I believe there's a way to calculate like how, like how many moles of electrons can generate how much ampere. So yeah, maybe you can do that in the future. It's milliampere. It's milliampere. Or microamps. Can, can you go back to the slide where you had your, your reading? I just wanted to hear this to clarify. Yeah, if we had had um, the ability yeah. to use that, then that yeah. would have been great. But cool. um, any other, any other questions? No? All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, so uh, that is our halfway point. So. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break so everybody can get up, stretch, use the restrooms which are just located down the hall and let's be back here at um, 1140.
No, you go first. Here, you can just no, use me. this mic. Yeah. I go or first. we can all use this. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, go ahead and put your on. Okay, Where's you guys ready? All right, so um, if we can, everyone go ahead and settle down, then we will start with our next group. I'm Cece. I'm Saren. I'm Kevin. I'm Michael. And I'm Renardo. And we did our project on the analysis of different filtration methods on pesticide removal from water. 780 million, that's the amount of people who lack access to potable water, with the average With the average walking distance just in Africa and Asia to get water being 3.7 miles, meaning that the lack of accessible water is a relevant problem. So scientists have been doing a lot of research in getting uh, clean water for people around the world, and because it's such a prevalent problem. For example, in 2010, in a paper published in the Desalination Journal, scientists were able to filter the pesticide methylmil out of water 100% with the use of iron nanoparticles and zeolite. And then another group of researchers from India and Saudi Arabia have been able to filter pesticides using activated carbon. And they published this research paper in a journal called Water Research. So for our experiment, um, we tested out a total of three experimental groups, activated carbon, silver nanoparticles, and activated carbon with silver nanoparticles. Um, the control groups, activated carbon and silver nanoparticles, um, was compared with the combined method. And activated carbon is a form of carbon processed to have small, low volume pores that increase the surface area available for absorption. Um, these methods were tested in the removal of model compounds and two of, pest of two pesticides. Um, yeah. um, so the original pesticides that we were going to filter out were glyphosate and atrazine, and we chose these two pesticides because they are two of the most common pesticides in the world. Um, but we had to use alternate substitutions for these pesticides because um, glyphosate and atrazine are very hard to work with and they're difficult to obtain, and they're also like real pesticides, so they would have like a dangerous presence in the lab. So the, pe the first pesticide we wanted to experiment with was um, glyphosate, but we could not attain that. So we used a um, substitution substance called tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid used in the biosynthesis of proteins. The reason why we chose tryptophan as our model compound for glyphosate was because we found that it actually possesses some fairly similar properties as glyphosate. The second um, substance we wanted to work with was resveratrol. Um, the second um, substance, uh, Con, um, pesticide that we wanted to work with was atrazine, but we could not get that as well, so we substituted with a similar substance called resveratrol. However, it is important to note that we did not use um, pure, pure resveratrol in this experiment because we could not get it, so we created a compound using trans res 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 resveratrol and another compound called per um, perostobine. Resveratrol is a natural phenol and an organic compound, and perostobine has two methyl groups added to the chemical structure of, res of resveratrol. So our research question was which filtration method will be the most effective in removing harmful pesticides from water? And by comparing the combination of silver nanoparticles and activated carbon with activated carbon by itself, we can determine which method is the most effective. And our hypothesis was that the combination of activated carbon and silver nanoparticles would be the most useful and effective in filtering out the model pesticide compounds from the water. And the reason we made this hypothesis was that in a paper published by ACS, um, a group of researchers were able to filter out the pesticide lindane from water um, with a success rate of 99.9% using a nanocomposite of reduced graphene oxide and silver nanoparticles. And we thought that silver nanoparticles with the support of activated carbon would be able to be the most effective at filtering out these model pesticide compounds from water. So our first step in basic experimenting was to create the two solutions containing our model contaminants, being tryptophan and resveratrol, in which we created three different concentrations of each based to test our filtration on. Next, we synthesized our silver nanoparticles as one of our filtration methods, uh, methods and where we create, you combine a sodium citrate solution with silver nitrate solution heat up for like 80 degrees Celsius and remove the solution containing our newly formed silver nanoparticles. And the nanoparticles themselves resembled 
the solution B the most, which is about the mid-range size of about 70 nanometers. So um, next, we got two separate beakers and filled the, the first beaker up with tryptophan and the second beaker with resveratrol. We then used pipettes to transfer the solutions into the vials containing carbon, silver, and mixed filtration methods. Later, we put this new mixed solution through syringes with filters attached and transferred the filter solutions into new vials. Well, this is a control color group change. We can see that all vials from A to F change from black uh, to clear. This was due to use of activated carbon. Uh, here is our tests, and this was after filtration, and each one had different molar concentrations. For a silver color change chart, we can observe that A to F changed from pale yellow to clear, whereas D to F changed from, had no change at all, sorry. This was due to the fact that silver nanoparticles did not work as well as activated carbon. And for a final chart, we can see that the concentration, um, all vials from A to F changed from opaque black to clear, and we will later explain wh why. So by comparing the results from um, the UV-Vis spectrophotometer to the spectrum curve shown above, we can determine the concentration of remaining tryptophan and resveratrol in the vials. And as you can see in the spectrum curves, the, absor the absorbance spectrum of resveratrol peaks at a wavelength of 305 um, nanometers, and the absorbance spectrum of tryptophan peaks at a wavelength of 280 nanometers. From our results, we can see that from these graphs, um, the activated carbon method was able to filter out most of the tryptophan um, in the solutions. And in particular, it was the most successful in filtering out tryptophan from the 0 0.00024 molar um, solution, which indicates that there is most likely a limit to the amount of tryptophan that activated carbon can filter out. And there's also a clear trend in the amount of tryptophan that was um, filter it out as the results correlate with the initial concentrations of these solutions. For the silver nanoparticles method, we can see that there is clearly a concentrated amount of tryptophan still remaining in the filtered solutions. Um, although we did not expect the silver nanoparticles to be able to filter out any of the contaminants by itself, we tested this in order to verify um, this hypothesis. And in this graph, we can see that there is still a trend in the concentration of tryptophan remaining. Um, looking at the tryptophan filtration graph, representing basically how we filter it through activate carbon and silver nanoparticles, you can see that where the peaks were suspected to be like in the last graphs, there are no peaks. In fact, they are relatively flat, meaning that after filtration, in the remaining vials, you can see black to white, um, there was no tryptophan left in the filter solution. And for our first resveratrol filtration using activated carbon, um, in the two smaller concentrations, you can see that the lines both were flat, meaning that there were no resveratrol left. It's also nice to note that in the higher concentration, with 0 0.01 molars, um, it's, there was still a peak, but not where it was expected, because um, we did not use pure resveratrol, meaning that the other compound may have had an effect, and that was what was detected instead of resveratrol. And for our resveratrol filtration using silver nanoparticles, you can see that this graph resembles the original UV vis graphs about resveratrol, um, closely resembles the resveratrol graphs from the UV vis, showing that the uh, silver nanoparticles again did not work in filtering anything out. So as for the filtration of resveratrol through the combined method, we can see here that most of the resveratrol was um, effectively filtered out. For the 0 0.01 molar solution, um, the small amount of resveratrol that um, was not filtered out can actually be accommodated by the fact that we ran out of silver nanoparticles towards the end of our experiment. Um, and since the 0 0.01 molar um, solution vial was the last vial we had to fill, it received a smaller amount of silver nanoparticles um, compared to the other two vials. And in future experiments, we should make sure that we have an equal amount of silver nanoparticles per vial. Uh, so all this data helps us come to the conclusion that the combination of activated carbon and silver nanoparticles was actually the most effective in completely removing all traces of tryptophan and resveratrol from the contaminated solutions. 
And although we do not have an exact explanation in why the combination method worked the best, we believe that the silver nanoparticles acted as a nanocomposite to the activated carbon in the filtration of the model compounds. So a nanocomposite is a matrix to which nanoparticles have been added to improve a particular property of um, the material, and in this case, it's activated carbon. But even though our, hypoth our hypothesis is supported by the results, in the future, we should perform multiple trials in order to verify our data, uh, and also we should um, run our original unfiltered vials through UV-Vis so that we can compare the unfiltered data with the filtered data. So from our experiment, we can conclude that our hypothesis that the combination of activated carbon and silver nanoparticles would be the most effective was uh, correct. And then some things that we could do in the future is first to use pure resveratrol instead of the combination with terostilbene and see what, that, what effect that has on our experiments. And then also to test with the original pesticides instead of using model compounds to see exactly how these filtration methods work on actual pesticides. And then lastly, we plan on using, uh, trying out different types of nanoparticles since this time we only use silver nanoparticles and to see uh, what kind of filtration methods they can provide for filtering out contaminants from water. original research question was to find a cost-efficient and effective way to filter out um, the contaminants, and we actually found out that the silver nanoparticles work better in a lower concentration, so we didn't use, we barely used any um, silver in the making of the nanoparticles. I think it was to filter out the carbon, which um, should have absorbed the contaminants. Okay, so what about the silver nanoparticles? So the silver nanoparticles weren't actually filtered out by the filters, so um, we think that it, they may have still been in the actual um, solutions after using the filter. testing the silver nanoparticles by itself was just to prove that um, it didn't work as a filter. So we, we're not trying to actually use silver by itself. I guess if we want to get, we, if, if we want to aim for like pure water to filter out like everything, all the contaminants, um, we should definitely like consider how much silver we will actually need in the long run. Yeah. But our experiment itself was just to test whether, which combination would work the best. So in the future, we obviously have to think about cost and um, like the scale, how it would affect um, having to filter out water for the entire world. But right now we just wanted to test the differences between activated carbon and the combination, just to prove a hypothesis. Also, to answer your first question, um, there actually was a significant difference, if we could go back to the data to look at, there was a significant difference between the amount of the mo molecules compared to like 
to filtration using only activated carbon and filtration using activated carbon combined with silver nanoparticles. With this trend showing like there's nothing left as the, um, it all resonates where it's supposed to be zero, but, and with the um, only, only using activated carbon, there's still like a detectable amount left after. trying to know if it would also work with pesticides. It was just like a thought. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier in the article that we read at, about silver nanoparticles being used with graphene oxide and reducing and filtering pesticides, we thought that it would work with activated carbon as well. Hi, I'm Maverick. I'm Angela. I'm Tiffany. I'm Donnie. I'm Vincent. And basically our experiment was on the effect of oleic acid percentage in ferrofluids uh, on their thermal conductivities. So what is ferrofluid? Ferrofluid is a fluid containing uh, suspended nanoparticles called magnetite that react and create spikes when in the presence of a magnetic field. So uh, ferrofluids were first created by NASA scientists in order to load fuel into spacecrafts. Uh, some of the present day application include brakes, engines, motors, and speakers since they reduce friction. And basically the purpose of our experiment is to find uh, whether oils are more thermally conductive than water. And so you might be asking the question, why ferrofluid? Ferrofluids are high in thermal conductivity, meaning they transfer heat at a faster rate. And they also uh, are used in speakers to prevent them from overheating. Uh, ferrofluids are also more effective than normal dampers. And they significantly reduce the effect of outside uh, vibrations. So on this diagram, you can see that Ferrofluids are coated around the voice coil, and they do that so that they can hold the voice coil in place using magnetic forces. And so that when the voice coil is heated up, it, when it expands, it doesn't scrape the top plate, because when it, if it does, then that would ruin the speaker. So for our experiment, we hypothesized that the least thermally conductive ferrofluid would be the one containing 80% oleic acid, and we also used 100% pure oleic acid for our surfactant, which prevents the clumping of our nanoparticles. And the reason why to which we predicted that is because um, oleic acid is less thermally conductive than water. And um, it also is a larger capping agent or like a capping layer um, as the surfactant and it would thermally insulate our nanoparticles. Um, over there to the right, you can see uh, the, mo the molecular structure for um, oleic acid. And for our experiment, we used olive oil, which contained 80% uh, oleic acid, and canola oil, which contained 62% oleic acid. And the reason why we chose oil as the base for our, um, for our ferrofluid to test is because water currently used water-based ferrofluids are um, or they require um, a toxic surfactant, which would lead to um, contamination of like um, 
I guess, toxic waste. It would lead to toxic waste. And um, for our oil-based ferrofluids, we would use oleic acid, which can be found in normal cooking oil, and that would not, and we could pour it down the drain without causing like contaminants or toxic waste. Um, in order to make our ferrofluid, we first um, combined our FeCl2 and FeCl3 into solution form, and we swirled it and added ammonium hydroxide uh, to suspend our nanoparticles into the liquid, and after that, we put magnets on the bottom of the beaker in order to uh, settle our nanoparticles, and the excess liquid would then be um, poured out into our waste container and with the magnet on the bottom to prevent the magnetite from falling out, and we would also, we would then um, pour out our ex or our remaining magnetite into a weigh boat and put on a surfactant. Um, we would put on uh, oleic acid for our oil-based um, fair fluids, and we would and put on uh, tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide for our water-based fair fluid. And after um, mixing it into like a homogeneous solution, we would. Uh, see something like the picture all the way to the right, and that was actually the picture for our water-based ferrofluid that we did in the beginning of our experiment. Okay, so in order to measure the thermal conductivity of our ferrofluids, we first had to calculate the power of our hot plates. Um, so to do this, we placed 50 milliliters of water into an Erlenmeyer flask, and then we set our hot plate to 200 degrees <coughs> Celsius. Then we calculated the power knowing the specific heat of water is 4.18 using Q equals um, C delta T. Um, so in order to have enough fluid for our thermal conductivity calculations, we needed to dilute our ferrofluids. Um, so we put three milliliters of ferrofluids into four different Erlenmeyer flasks. Um, and for one of them, we used water, and for the rest, we used oil. Um, for the one with water, we only put water, obviously. Um, and then for the other ones, um, for the 63% oleic acid, we put more canola oil than olive oil. Um, for the 67% oleic acid, we put equal amounts of canola and olive oil. And then for the 80% oleic acid flask, um, we put um, only olive oil, so no water or canola oil. And then to measure our thermal conductivity, we put our flasks onto a hot plate that was heated to 200 degrees Celsius. Um, and then we put a test tube with three milliliters of water inside and then a thermometer. And then we measured the time it took to reach, um, for the water to reach 60 degrees Celsius. And then to calculate our thermal, thermal conductivity, we used unit analysis. Um, so we found the power of the hot plate and then we divided that by the temperature change times the distance, which we found to be 2.5 centimeters, and the time it took for each ferrofluid to conduct heat to the water to 60 degrees. Um, so this is what we expected to see from our experiment. So at first, we expected to see that um, the ferrofluid containing the highest percentage of oleic acid would take the longest time for the water to heat up to 60 degrees Celsius. That would mean that um, it was the least thermally conductive. And we ex also expected to see that the water-based ferrofluid would take um, the shortest amount of time, meaning that it's the most thermally conductive. So this is uh, a table with our results that we recorded. Um, as you can see, we recorded the distance for um, the heat to travel for each um, percentage of oleic acid and the initial temperature and found the time taken as well. And from that, we calculated the heat flow and the specific heat and then ca calculated the thermal conductivity as Angela has told you about. Um, and to the right, the thermal conductivity column is highlighted. This is because, well, for one, <laughs> it's also like our aim to calculate the thermal conductivity. And also, um, it shows clearly that the percentage of oleic acid that has the highest thermal conductivity is 0% oleic acid, whereas the other percentages are much lower and quite similar to each other as well. So um, we plotted a graph and 
Um, this shows, again, that the 0% of oleic acid ha has the highest heat flow, and whereas the other ones are um, lower and quite similar. And this suggests that um, the presence of oleic acid in our ferrofluids um, causes the thermal conductivity to lower. And um, you can see there's not much difference between the 63% oleic acid, 67 and 80% oleic acid, um, the heat flow of that. Um, and so this suggests that unlike what we thought before, the different levels of, um, of oleic acid does not affect the thermal conductivity as much as we would have thought. So other from the results Nani just stated, we've came to several conclusions. First, we needed a higher concentration of nanoparticles, um, magnetite, in our ferrofluids. So as you could have seen in the previous slides, we had to dilute um, our ferrofluids in order to measure their thermal conductivity. And second, as a surfactant, oleic acid does not work, did not work as well as um, tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide did. Third, the linoleic, linoleic acid in the canola oil could have affected our experiment. So in the previous slide, you could have seen that um, the three different percentages of oleic acid, um, which is this site, did not differ significantly. That could also have been affected by the linoleic acid in the canola oil. Uh, and finally, we had some confusion on what, what surfactant we should have used for our oil-based ferrofluids. And we've listed several possible improvements. First, we could have controlled more variables um, from the table you've seen. Um, our initial temperatures of our ferrofluids um, deferred. So if we have, could have controlled that, our experiment could have been more precise. Second, we could have used more precise ways to calculate the heat flow, which is the thermal conductivity. For example, um, a lot of sources suggested the hot wire method, um, but we did not. We could have attempted that in the future. Next, we could try not to dilute the ferrofluid, but dilute the surfactant, since that is what is actually preventing the ferrofluids from clumping. And finally, we could repeat our experiment for more reliable results. Um, here are our future outlooks. We could use different metals, like those listed above, um, to make the ferrofluid, uh, trying to test the differences. And we could measure and improve other um, properties, other from thermal conductivity, that could also be advantageous for speakers such as viscosity in our ferrofluids. And finally, we could use and develop on um, creating more efficient ferrofluid speakers. Thank you. It, it's putting a wire in, inside, of, inside of the fluid and measuring the temperature. Um, possibly linoleic acid or linoleic acid. So that's why we listed that it could have affected our experiment. Did you test the uh, ferrofluid to see if it retained any of its uh, ferrofluidic properties after you filled it with? Um, most did not. Uh, they're still magnetic, but they wouldn't spike, basically. Yeah. something that you'd be interested in looking into in the future be like looking at your nanoparticles kind of like what some of the other groups have shown like taking SEM images of them and then you know you could maybe get some information about the how size. your surfactant is actually behaving is that something you had potentially considered about looking at or yes
Let's just all stand here. We're just holding this thing. Yeah. By the way, uh, you're speaking to the model first, right? Is that what this is? Do you need is a laser pointer? Are you sure? How do you use it? Between. Okay. Uh, so I'm Connor. I'm Helen. I'm Francesco. I'm Chehan. I'm James. And this is our project. The development of a magnetically actuated magnetite nanoparticle infused biopolymer. In other words, it's a walking gel. So the overall goal of this project was to create a new method for uh, soft robots to move. Now, soft robots differ from regular robots in that they, the body of the robots um, contain zero or minimal hard parts. Advantages to this allow the soft robots to move in areas where regular mechanical robots would get either destroyed or they are either cheaper to produce. So this is a diagram of a robot that we would like to eventually create. So here is the body of the robot, which is um, created out of a biopolymer gel. And then we want to infuse um, a magnetic material into this gel to move it with electromagnets. So uh, our hypothesis for this experiment was that if we add tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide, uh, a magnetite coated in tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide, we could make a gel that could be uh, a biopolymer gel that could be controlled with magnetic fields. So um, our whole goal in this was kind of to develop that biopolymer and test it and see if we could actually make this into a gel that could move. So yeah, the scope of our uh, experiments on this was basically just the preliminary testing to the uh, kind of design James was talking about. So. Um, so we actually did not go into this project blind. There's been a little bit of research on uh, magnetic magnetite infused biopolymer gels, specifically in carrageenan, which is something that we tested. Um, this this article was probably our our biggest resource. Uh, it just basically is uh, an article that proves that you can suspend magnetite particles in a gel, and it it works. So for the first step of our experimental design, uh, our first step was to see if we could, in fact, suspend the magnetite particles, um, which is ferrofluid. Uh, so that was the study he'd been talking about, had said that for iota carrageenan, it was possible. So we tested this ourselves also. And for the second step, we had to test the, particle, the nanoparticle mobility of the magnetite to ensure that when we did put a magnet near it, the uh, magnetite particles would not be ripped out of the gel. And for our third step, we had to test different concentrations and different types of gels to see which one uh, had the proper flexibility uh, and rigidity to uh, build a robot out of that. And also, we had to test the attraction of our magnetite-infused biopolymers to magnets. OK, and here's the experiment procedure. And the first step we need to do is to make enough ferrofluid. And step two is to uh, mix the different kinds of uh, polymers uh, with water to get the gel. And then we use pepper to mix, mix the gel with the uh, uh, ferrofluid so that we can get a, uh, get a mag magnet containing the gel. OK, so this slide. Um, summarizes the results we got for the first experiment, which was seeing if the magnetite could be suspended in a gel. So for a 5% iota carrageenan and 5% magnetite biopolymer, this was successful. And when in the presence of a magnetic field, we have positive attraction from uh, the gel towards a magnet. 
Okay, uh, just kind of to branch off that that whole point. Uh, so another thing that was kind of exciting in this process was we uh, were using iota carrageenan, which in its solidification, or yeah, it uh, forms a double helix uh, based on like a positive binding agent in the middle, uh, which is typically calcium. That's what we used in our uh, prior experiments. But uh, one idea that we had is because it just needs to be a positive particle and the na um, magnetite nanoparticles, when they're coated in the tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide, they, uh, it creates a net positive charge on the outside layer of the particle. So we thought it might um, be able to substitute and solidify, which to, uh, to our excitement, it did do that. And it was able to solidify. And we ran it next to a control group of the same concentration of iota carrageenan. And it solidified much faster in a time scale of maybe 5 to 10 minutes, whereas the other one took a day, so it's not even in the same time frame. So it, it did, in fact, help the solidification process. Um, so just going into our second experiment, it was we had to, again, test, test the particle mobility. So basically, if the particles would rip themselves out of the gel when they were put next to a magnetic field for an extended period of time. And uh, they did not do that, so the gels can be long-lasting, in other words. Um, another, the other part of this second experiment uh, process was we tested a bunch of different materials. Specifically, we tested agar, agarose, uh, gelatin, so like jello, um, and uh, iota carrageenan, which I mentioned previously. And we figured out that uh, iota carrageenan had the kind of properties that we were going for. So it had a pretty good flexibility, and it also was tough enough to where it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna like mush in your hands, pretty much. So for the different uh, gels, we tested originally 5% concentrations. And out of the four gels we tested, the agar gel didn't really work out that well. But of the other three gels, the gelatin was very soft, so we couldn't even pick it up without it crumbling in our hands. The iota carrageenan, originally at 5%, was, a, was flexible and it was a good gel, but we needed it to be a little bit stronger. And the agarose was very strong, but very brittle. So if you tried to, if you tried to fold it, it would just break. Uh, so we used the Young's modulus equation to calculate how much stress these gels could take. And uh, to use it, uh, or to, in the equation, you stack pennies, and you take the number of pennies and plug it into the whole equation to find out the stress that you put on the gel. So this is a diagram showing how we tried to uh, test the attraction of the gel to the magnet. So what we did is we have a, up here we had a magnet, and we measured along a ruler to see how far away it was from the gel. And see, the gel here is sitting on top of a phone, which, and phones can actually test magnetic fields nearby. And so this is actually an app that we use to test the magnetic field. And so the gel is sitting here on top of the phone, on top of a scale here, measuring the mass. And so as we got brought the magnet closer to the gel, obviously the magnetic field increased. And as that happened, we were hoping that, and it did happen, that the gel would be attracted to the magnet, therefore uh, lifting some of it up off the scale, making the mass lower as it got closer. So this is the results from that test. Um, we tested, uh, first, um, this is the applied magnetic field versus the attractive force towards the magnet. So we have that force here and the applied magnetic field along the x-axis. The blue line you see here is the 20% magnetite uh, concentration gel, and the red line is the 10%. What we see here is that the magnetic properties are very similar, even when you vary the concentration between the two. However, the only difference is as the concentration gets higher, we have a um, proportional increase in force. And in summary, and in our experiment, the TMH can act as uh, calcium to form uh, the solidified gel. So we can assume that th this is because of the positive, uh, po positive charge. And in our experiment, the magnetite can suspend in the gel successfully. 
And after testing uh, several kinds of gel, we found that the 10% outer carrageenan gel was the most uh, uh, ideal gel for our experiment. And we, we can also check them uh, by using the magnets. So in the future, if we could develop this uh, experiment further, we would want to ch test different walking geometry. So by that, like change the shapes of the feet to see which shape would be the most effective for making the gel actually walk. And we would use electromagnets placed on the body of the gel to control one side at once so that it would move and kind of take steps forward. And we would develop different walking gates too to see like how, or like see how the robot would walk. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys show that first graph of applied magnetic field versus pressure on the piano? Do you have a theory as to what those two kinds of domains are, or like why it has a, a low amount here and then it goes up a little and then it starts going up really fast? Do you? Um, I believe. Uh, the first, this stuff here is just um, like imprecise data, so it might not. It's I don't believe it's the actual pattern, okay. because based on um, like fields and like the equation for the fields, it should have a exponential growth in force um, as the radius from the field decreases. So, yeah. The first one is noise. What about the second one? Uh, here. So or, it's like or the Okay, yeah, so the, I think this is where the exponential uh, growth in strength is seen. That was compared to a gel without, without, without anything. Yeah, without yeah. either no. calcium yeah. or tetramethylammonium. Um, we actually, we since we did a bunch of testing on a bunch of different substances, we didn't like directly compare them like side by side. But I can, I can pretty much tell you that the magnetite hardens a little slower. It is uh, the calcium is probably the fastest, uh, bind, uh, like catalyst, I guess, for the solidification. But um, the fact that magnetite is able to actually help in the solidification process is. Uh, actually a pretty cool uh, result because the size of calcium particle like calcium ions is so much smaller compared to a nano sized particle it it just shows that it is like it the the size doesn't necessarily matter as much as you might think initially yeah the calcium with the carrageenan actually solidified almost instantly as it was being pipetted out yeah Um, we did not observe on that uh, small of a scale, so we can't tell you conclusively what happened to the cross-linking. But we can say that uh, the magnetite remained in place, so we can infer that the cross-linking was more or less uh, the same. Yeah, just to just to elaborate that, it's uh, the the in that was pretty much the uh, um, motion of the particles in the gel. Since we didn't actually see anything, uh, I think it's it's pretty safe to say that it didn't have a lot of effect on the actual structure of the iota, iota carrageenan gels that it was in, or pretty much any of the gels that were solid. So it's, if if anything, it would be extremely minimal and not not like at play, if you know what I mean. Um, I think if you increase the size to a point where the magnetic moments aren't, um, like, 
separated as they are when they're nano-sized, that would decrease the magnetic energy and perhaps decrease the attractive force. Yeah, you would as you as you increase the particles, the domain sizes, you you begin to get domain interference, and and it's at, you get farther and farther away from that like ideal super paramagnet. magnet. And we also did have some differing size in uh, the particle size because we can't add it, we can't add ammo ammonium hydroxide perfectly at the same rate for each experiment. So there probably was differing sizes, but not significantly. I would say. Yeah. Uh, okay, so hello everyone. I'm Michelle. Uh, I'm Ray Kong. I'm Carson. I'm Peter. Coco. And we tested the cooling properties of ferrofluids depending on their nanoparticle size. So, uh, if you guys don't know enough, um, ferrofluids, so what are exactly, like, what are they? Um, ferrofluids are paramagnetic, meaning that. Um, the ferrofluid itself won't tr attract anything, but when, apply when there's an applied magnetic field, um, the ferrofluid will be attracted to it. And as for its components, um, well, there's the actual magnetic nanoparticle, which we use magnetite, and it's also susp suspended in a carrier fluid, usually like an oil. And um, we also use a surfactant, which is like this um, soapy substance that coats each nanoparticle to prevent them from making little clumps. So what are some common uses for ferrofluids? Well, in the future, um, some potential um, uses for them could be for cancer treatment, such um, through both drug, tr drug transfer and magnetic hyperthermia. And what magnetic hyperthermia is, is essentially you would inject a ferrofluid into um, tumor cells and use alternating magnets to create um, heat, which would uh, essentially destroy those cells without harming um, nearby cells. It could also be used for some spacecraft propulsion in the future, but some uses right now for it are for friction decreasing agents and for cooling in speaker systems, which is what really caught our attention and what we did our experiments on. So to elaborate on more of what Carson was talking about, uh, about speaker cooling, is that there's kind of a cycle of cooling that happens within the system. Basically, there's an electromagnet and there's a heat sink. And when the temperatures of the ferrofluids increase, their magnetism decreases in proportion. So because of that, the cold ferrofluids are more attracted to electromagnetic, while the hot ferrofluids are pushed away towards the heat sink. What the heat sink does is basically absorbs the heat of the hot ferrofluid and basically it repeats this cycle of cooling over and over again. So our question is that how do ferrofluids with different uh, nanoparticle size influence the cooling system? So the time the cooling down, we think it might be influenced by the na nanoparticle size of the ferrofluids. Uh, we think about this because we think uh, if we figure out this question, maybe we can do something to improve the speakers, the cooling down system in speakers, yeah. So uh, our guess is that uh, ferrofluids with larger nanoparticles, uh, nanoparticles are more, can more cooling down more faster, uh, can cooling down faster. Um, we think this uh, is because, um, uh, the nano, the ferrofluids with larger nanoparticles have more uh, surface, has a, have a larger surface to connect with the speaker, so the liquid can uh, cooling it down faster than the ferrofluids nanoparticles, so it can cooling down faster with the larger nanoparticles ferrofluids. So how do we determine the size of a nanoparticle? Well, first we have to use a scanning electron microscope, or an SEM, 
And essentially what this is, it's, it's a gigantic microscope that sends a beam of electrons um, that plots images of nanoparticles and you're able to see up to 10 nanometers small on what you're looking at. And for our um, nanoparticles, we had um, varying sizes in our um, bigger nanoparticles. We weren't able to pick up our um, smaller nanoparticles um, between the two experiments that we did um, because th they were either too small or it was the solution was too dilute. But for our bigger nanoparticles, we were able to um, measure the smaller ones um, being 10 nanometers and those big clumps in the middle w are about 25 nanometers big. Um, so during the experiment, we added two milliliters of ferrous fluid into the medium sized vials and then we heated up waters and the small vials to the certain temperature at the same temperature. And then we placed two milliliters of hot water into the <coughs> smaller vial and waited until the water was 45 degrees. And then we put the small size vial into the medium one. From there, we started timing how long it will take for the water to reach 35 degrees. We recorded the temperature of the water every minute and stopped the timer when it reached 35 degrees. And we did this with a small and large nanoparticle ferrous fluids. Our control was placing the vial with water into an empty medium-sized vial, basically letting the water cool by air. So these are our results. And from this graph, you can see that the water in each trial started at 45 degrees. The control, which was a small vial of hot water placed in, well, a large vial of nothing, um, took the longest to reach 35 degrees at six minutes and 58 seconds. So this blue line. The fair fluid in which the smaller nanoparticle, the, the fair fluid with the smaller nanoparticles in orange came in second at six minutes and 16 seconds. It actually performed quite similarly to the control, yet I think there is a difference because it had a difference of um, 42 seconds. Um, but you can really see the difference with the third ferrofluid, with, um, which had the largest particles, which is in gray right here. Um, it reached 35 degrees within four minutes and 43 seconds, which is actually more than two minute difference than the control. And the water also cooled down at a much faster rate. So what does this, do, do, what do these results tell us? Well, we know it essentially confirmed our original hypothesis and told us that the bigger the nanopart the bigger the nanoparticle size is, then the faster the cooling rate will be. Um, here are some limitations for our experiment. One of them is the bulk size, which refers that a single nanoparticle is different than the gathering of nanoparticles. They have different characteristics. So if other science groups intend to do further researches based on our results, it might not work accurately. And the next problem of our experiment is the limitation of our number of samples. Because of our t um, limiting time, we only did two samples. So if we are um, looking forward to get more accurate results, we need more. And the third one is the room temperature. Um, the hot water cooled down by the ferrofluid fluid was also cooled by the relatively cold air meanwhile. So our data might be influenced. So here are some ways we can further enhance our results. First one is to increase the amount of volume you have for our ferrofluids. fluids. So when we were testing it, not all of our vial was basically surrounded by the ferrofluid. fluid. However, if we use a larger volume of ferrofluid, then more of the heat would be transferred to the ferrofluid instead of the outside surroundings, giving us a more accurate data on how the heat um, transfer happened between the water and the ferrofluid. Another idea we had was using multiple different sizes of um, nanoparticles. Because we only had two samples, we had a fairly limited amount of data. But if we had more different sizes of nanoparticles, we would have a more accurate image or trend of what would be going on as nanoparticle size varied. So what are we going to do to perfect our experiment is that uh, we'll test other uh, characteristics of fur floods that might affect cooling. So that means we just can make it more 
exactly the data. And we will test fire floods used in real life situations. That uh, means we are going to just make it the real effect in our daily life and just in speakers, I mean. Uh, and we will consider possible uh, downsides of using fire floods with larger nanoparticle size. So we are going to just uh, make more uh, fire floods and just test them and we'll get more data and we can just use them. Thank, Thank you. you. It's not a matter of work, working like worse or better. It's more about like when it's so it's when it's that small at the nano scale. It's just the properties of it are just so different than when it's like all together. So um, yeah, <laughs> basically. Mm, well, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to test, and well, as of now, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> they go through those cycles more quickly so then that means the cooling rates can the cooling can also occur more faster Um, hi, I'm Nanita. I'm Amy. Uh, I'm Joshua. I'm Anna. I'm Rowena. So in this research project, we tested the capability of three common sugar indicators in, at, in at B to develop a portable indicators for sugar levels um, for, to benefit diabetics. So type 2 diabetes is a disease caused by insulin resistance. Insulin is a hormone that regulates blood sugar levels. As you can see from the schematics here, um, normal people could absorb glucose into their body systems. However, for those with insulin resistance, they could not absorb um, glucose, and um, the glucose would remain in their bloodstream. As a result, they would have a high blood sugar levels. Um, currently, there are gl blood glucose meters that measure the um, level of sugar in their blood. However, only, it, it only measures the sugar level of their blood after their consumption. We believe that by developing a sugar indicator um, for, um, to test sugar level in food, diabetes can get a better idea of the amount of sugar that their food contain before their consumption. So assay beads are beads that have nano-sized pores, and they observe the solution that they are placed in. So in our experiment, we're using assay beads to observe indicators, which are um, substances that change color when they react with sugar. The three indicators we used are the Amplex uh, Red, Benedict Solution, and Thaling Solution. The Amplex Red turns pink when, um, co when it comes in contact with sugar, and the Benedict Solution turns yellow. The Thaling Solution also turns yellow and then red later. So we have two research questions. The first one is which assay bead is the most effective at detecting sugar content? And the second question is to what extent can these assay beads effectively and safely detect sugar content? and ripe and unripe fruits, and also different fruit mixtures as well. 
We hypothesized that Amplex drag will be the most effective at detecting sugar content because uh, the particle sizes fit the nanopores in the beads per, um, nearly perfectly, uh, while the Benedict's and Veiling solution, uh, they have slightly smaller, smaller particles than the nanopores, so they, there's a slight chance that they'll like, possibly come out of the nanopores, which makes it less effective. However, for all of these, we expect to see a wide range of colors with obvious difference be showing between higher and lower sugar, sugar concentrations. Our experiment will benefit diabetics by allowing them to have a have an effective, safe, and easy method to de detect different sugar concentrations when eating food to promote a healthier um, lifestyle. Um, as you can see here, this is an overview of our experiment, and we will be testing. We, we tested um, four different concentrations of sugar solutions: 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 0.8 molars. And all of these will be tested with three indicators, the first one being um, a solution of Amplex Red, glucose oxidase, hor and horseradish peroxidase, um, Benedict solution, and Felix solution. And as an extension to this experiment, we'll be testing um, on ripe and unripe bananas and also the mango agogo smoothie from Jamba Juice to actually see if the beads will work in real life situations of testing food. Um, for the first part of the experiment, we did our um, ex experiment on Amplex, the Amplex Red solution, as said before. Um, we left our absorption polymer beads in the solution for approximately 20 minutes for it to absorb um, the solution. Later, we placed them into samples of our sugar um, solutions, which we later obtained data from. Um, on the second part, we used the Benedict solution, which, again, we left our absorption beads inside for it to absorb, and we placed them into the vials and lightly heated them for um, the sugar to actually oxidize. Um, so as shown here, these are the expected colors of our beads after, we, after it actually reacts. And for the final part of the experiment, we'll be, we tested on <coughs> With felling solution, again, we left absorption beads to absorb the solution, and we heated it slightly um, in the sugar solution, and these are the expected outcomes. As shown in this graph on the left, the intensity of the color of the beads containing Amplex Red solution gradually increased along with the increase in concentration. However, when it reached, um, when it reached one molar, the increase of intensity stopped. Um, similarly, for the beads containing Benedict solution and failing solutions, um, the intensity of the solution's color increased along with the increase of concentration. Concentration, However, um, when it reached 0.8 molar, it stopped as well. This indicates a de detection range for the beads containing three various um, sugar assays. Um, this means that when the um, sugar concentration of the solution exceeds the de detection range, there would be no co further um, color difference. Um, furthermore, diffusion behaviors vary among beads containing different sugar assays. The assay particles in beads containing Amplex Red, um, HRP, and GOX did not diffuse into the sugar solution through the nanopores, um, and the colors of the beads remained pink. This is because the assay particles for the um, uh, for the amplex red is the same as the nanopore size. Therefore, it, is, it would be hard for them to diffuse out. However, as for the beads containing Benedict solution and failing solutions, the assay particles diffused into the sugar solution through the nanopores in the beads um, right after they were dropped into the solutions. In addition, yellow precipitates are formed and the color of the beads remain blue, which means that the reaction happened outside the beads in the solution, but not within the solution as we expected. This is because the assay particles um, uh, the assay particles of Benedict solution and failing solutions are too small for the nanoparticles, uh, nanopores to contain them. Therefore, it's very e easily for them to diffuse. So after testing the beads in the, in, the known, in the sugar solutions with known concentrations, we decided to test these beads in real food to see if how effective they would be. So first, 
we put the Amplex red beads in ripe banana juice and unripe banana juice. So a few seconds after placing the Amplex red beads in, they, they both turned pink. And as you can see in the picture, both of the pink beads, they don't have much of a color difference. So that means that the, even, even though they're supposed to have a difference in sugar concentration because it's a ripe banana and an unripe banana, however, the sugar concentration is so high that the beads are unable to, te to detect it. After that, we also tested the Benedict solution beads in the banana juice. And so for the Benedict solution to react with the sugar, we have to heat the banana juice up. But then since there, there was so little water in the banana juice, it pretty much dried up after a few minutes. So the reaction wasn't complete. The reaction wasn't completed. And again, the colors of the beads are the same. So the beads are unable to, det to determine the sugar concentration of the banana juice. For the mango agogo solution that we got from Jamba Juice, we decided to only test it with Amplex Red. Uh, we decided against uh, with, with not, not testing using Benedict's and failing solution because the particle sizes, when heated up, would fall out more easily. Great, uh, for uh, making the particles fall into your food, which would be highly unwanted. But so after testing the mango agogo solution with Amplex Red, it gave out a deep pink color that you can see on the screen here. Uh, this deep pink color was outside of our detection limit. It was actually above, so we were unable to decide the sugar concentration. So from our experiment, we found out that Amplex Red is the most effective method for um, indicating sugar. Other indicators diffuse immediately out of the beads um, during the reaction, but Amplex Red enzymes are the perfect size for the nanopores in the water and the beads. It also doesn't require a heating process, which is more efficient and convenient. Some of the errors in our experiment, or errors and limitations in our experiment, include um, how we only measure two bananas, and in the future we should try more ripe and unripe fruits. The indicators were also unable to detect the concentration differences because they were too high. So for future extensions of the project, we would work on finding a, a better container for the indicators, because currently when we're using the beads, the indicators would diffuse out of the beads eventually. So we have to prevent the diffusion so that the indicator wouldn't get into the food. And also we are working on find, uh, finding a reusable design, because currently if you use the beads and it changes color, it stays that way and can't, you can't use it anymore. So we could find an indicator that has a reversible reaction. And lastly, S we need a, wide, a much wider range of detection because the bees can only detect up to one molar concentration of sugar. We're not testing the blood sugar level, we're testing the sugar level in the food. So. Uh, <coughs> what's actually our Benedict solution and failing solution? Um, Benedict solution is um, a solution with um, different chemicals like copper sulfate and sodium citrate. Sodium citrate. <laughs> sodium carbonate. <laughs> yeah, and falling solution um, contains um, sodium tartrate and also copper sulfate and, all and many more other chemicals. We did think of diluting them, but then we didn't have enough time to do that because our purpose of the experiment is just to test which indicator is the most effective with the beads.
And let's give one round of applause to all of the groups. It's a good job done by everyone today. Um, I will say from experience, and I think all of the graduate students in the room would agree, um, it's not easy to do an experiment and try to design it well and then get up in front of a group of your peers and experts and talk about your results and be asked questions. It's a very, it can be a very intimidating and challenging process. So congrats to all of you guys for getting up and doing, doing a good job and doing the best that you were able to with the very limited time that you had to really conduct and discuss these experiments. And I hope that uh, after doing your presentations and as you guys reflect on your time in this program, that you take all of the things that you learned um, both the science that you learned and all of the skills that you learned in your workshops. And I hope that you see how it all kind of comes together uh, as, uh, as a scientist, as a, as a sort of a, a, uh, a scientist in training, as you guys all are now. And whether or not you guys go into science as a career, um, I hope you see that the skills that you learned will be really, really applicable, no matter what it is that you end up doing. These skills of... Uh, thinking about a question that you have, finding a way to test that question, and then finding a way to discuss and defend your ideas. These are skills that are really important no matter where you end up. Um, so if you guys end up in science, then I hope that this is a good sort of mini training ground for what you're really going to encounter. And in whatever you do, I hope that you remember what you learned and uh, find them useful. So thank you and congratulations to everyone for completing a really rigorous two weeks. Good job. And, uh, and we have a nice reception for everyone outside. There's some food, some beverages. Um, before we go into the reception, um, I would like to just do two things. Um, one, um, Dr. Sarah Tolbert is here. And um, I think it would be great if she would come up just for a brief minute and uh, say a few words as the director of the outreach program and really the director of the, the summer programs as well. And then after that, um, I'm going to take us all outside under the CNSI sign so we can take a group photo of everyone. So I am attached. OK, so I just wanted to take one second to uh, just um, really acknowledge what you guys have done in the last two weeks. We have a number of summer programs that we run through the Nanoscience Institute. Sorry. for. Introductions. Uh, my name is Sarah Tolbert. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And the students have all met me because I talked to you guys about a bunch of science. Um, but for other people, I'm the faculty director of this program. And I just want to say, this is a really unique opportunity what you did in the last two weeks. So we have other summer programs for our high school students. But those programs are much more defined. We have a set of experiments. You do the experiments. We tell you what to expect. And this is much more open-ended. And doing open-ended science as a high school student is not simple. So I teach a class for graduate students that all these guys, all the people who've been running this program, most of them have taken. And it's got an open-ended project. And this like hurts the brain of graduate students to come up with a new experiment and make it work. And to be doing this. Um, at a high school age is just incredibly impressive. And so you guys should give all of yourselves a pat on the back for saying, I've started in the real process of being a scientist, which means saying, what the heck do I do next now? <laughs> and, <laughs> and that is the process that you will go through for your entire life as a scientist, and that's why it's fun to be a scientist. Because you are not bored. You are thinking really hard about, what should I do to make this come out in a really exciting and interesting way? Um, have you already acknowledged all the grad student mentors? Because if not, yes, I did. But okay. Feel free to acknowledge them again. So, <laughs> okay. So I want to just end by um, first uh, giving a round of applause to all your grad student mentors. You guys could stand up. You could stand up. Um, I, 
and then lastly, I get the opportunity to everybody to give a round of applause to Rita, who has been the soul of this program and really um, deserves a great. Okay, so now you get, well, I don't know if you get food or picture first. Uh, picture first. Picture first and then you get food. Okay.